There are so many things that you've said in that presentation which are truly fascinating. Um, uh, uh, in particular, I think you know, you're putting a toolbox in people's uh, hands that is immediately paying not just incremental returns, but in some cases exponential ones. I mean, a 10x increase in farm production is, is extra extraordinary and is, you're unlikely to find that in any, any environment, I would have thought. I would like now to invite um, Ashok, uh, Ash Ashok Shah of APA Insurance and Anthony from Unilever to come and join us uh, for a panel discussion. Ashok uh, Shah serves as the group CEO of Apollo Investments Limited, CEO of APA Insurance, Director of Apollo Life Insurance, Apollo Asset Management, the CDSC, which is the Central Depository and Settlement Corporation Limited, Reliance Insurance Company, um, and sits on uh, non-executive director of Barclays Kenya, um, serves as the director of the Capital Markets Challenge Fund. Um, but he's been really at the cutting edge of the insurance uh, uh, industry uh, innovation. One of the things you might have remembered was the weather insurance product. That was an Apollo product. And uh, you see the level of innovation in the fact that he's sitting up here on a panel with a Pago Solar uh, company. And we also have um, Anthony Esiolai, who I've been following on Twitter, but this is the first time we've actually met. And uh, Anthony, let me just read you the first uh, paragraph because it kind of sums him up. Lives to disrupt, thinking without the box, pushing boundaries, self-proclaimed activist, um, driving passion and purpose. Uh, diverse commercial and strategic management experience spanning almost 20 years in the FMCG sector. He was telling me earlier that he was at East African breweries and was in charge of Tusca, but didn't drink. And uh, I found that amusing. <laughs> but uh, Anthony uh, is responsible for East Africa, uh, including Ethiopia. And uh, earlier the, today was sharing some very interesting uh, um, uh, information around these markets. So, from my perspective, and in a selfish way, it's a real privilege to have three innovators on a panel here who are exploring parts of the economy that some of us economists tend not to focus sufficiently on. And I think we got a masterclass um, earlier on about the scale, the size of that economy, and imagine what they're actually doing is actually what they're saying on the label. They're flicking a switch on that enormous economy, which is about, just in numbers, the market size is about half of Africa. So it's a real privilege to have all of you um, here today. And um, let me throw out my, my, first, my first question. Listening to the presentation, listening to both of you earlier, it seemed to me that, you know, capitalism, as is reported, is being reinvented. In this new sort of 21st, uh, 21st century, you three are collaborating now to bring, uh, uh, you've micro-sized it, you're bringing a whole um, uh, new stuff down the pipe to people who, who previously were off the radar except for very intrepid businessmen who would, go, who would be prepared to go, go there. Is this a new, is this a new age of, a, a new type of economy, a new age of doing business? How would you describe it? And can I start with you, Anthony? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, it's an interesting one because one of the things we realize is that um, to keep growing business in the 21st century and beyond, you can't use the traditional models of just pumping products out on your own and winging it. Um, success now depends on more strategic partnerships. Um, working with like-minded organizations that 
provide strength that you don't have. So when Simon spoke about Unilever's distribution strength, it's a real strength that um, Azuri probably spent years and lots of money building, and they don't need to. Because there's a congruence, there's a, there's a meeting of interest. Unilever wants to create sustainable um, business models, creating a brighter future for people, and it meets somewhere with what Azuri wants to do. So by part collaborating on our distribution network and enabling us to have access to these consumers' mining insights from the ground up, you actually go a lot further. <coughs> so yes, the old capitalistic model me would say, go it alone, everybody's an enemy, and you, know, you win on your own. <coughs> it can't work anymore. And that's how we got into these partnerships. And Unilever is creating these kind of partnerships across not only in Kenya, but all over the world. So that's, that's the way I would see it. Ashok, Ashok um, you know, as I said earlier, you've been an innovator. I particularly remember that weather insurance product, which you've told me you've reinvented because there were some challenges with it. But frequently, you know, I, when I look at the insurance sector, people always tell me, you know, this is a wide open opportunity. There's no insurance penetration. Tell me, uh, tell us a little bit about why this is a win-win for you, um, this collaboration, and what you're actually trying to deliver to that family. What difference are you trying to make? What impact are you making at that level? You know, for insurance, uh, for insurers in this world, in this country especially, um, we only we are only selling to the insured population. We're selling it to people like you here all of you sitting here, who know about insurance. But uh, the financial shock that the population in general that have, as, you, uh, you know, as uh, Simon said earlier on, they do not know how to protect themselves against financial shock. Even uh, a lot of us sitting around here is when you have somebody going into the hospital and the bill starts mounting, you start collecting money from friends relatives and so on, because you don't have the insurance. But when the, it comes to the rural population, you look at, uh, you know, we've done the, we are providing covers to the pastoralist in, in northern Kenya, where the cover is given not for the animals, but for the forage on the ground. Then we are also trying to go into the rural population, the agriculture area, where we started with weather index, but we've gone to the area yield index, where the farmer has got total cover up to 80%. But the problem is for us is the distribution. How do we get to that farmer? How do we get to the pastoralist? How do we get to the household, which needs an insurance cover to cover the financial shock much uh, sort of uh, like yesterday, not uh, even, uh, today. So we, we don't have the distribution network. Selling a 25 shillings product, as Simon said earlier on, for us is not a feasible pr proposal. So what we find that uh, something that uh, Azuri is doing, tying up with Azuri, because they are getting to the rural household that we will never be able to get to. So we, what we do is that we have tied up with Azuri and given the products that we feel initially the, the farmer can benefit from, farmer, the rural household can benefit from. So right now we're looking at give, providing them with funeral cover and hospital cash cover. In case the house owner is, is basically hospitalized, then they start getting an income that they will be able to look after. They don't have to get out of the hospital after one day just because they're worried about how the family is going to get food on the table, how the school fees are going to be paid. So with the partnership that we have with Azuri, as soon as the person, the householder, goes into hospital, after two days we start paying them a thousand shillings per night, income benefit, which they can then use, the, which can the family can use, and not worry about where the food is coming from on the table, and they can re recuperate, 
and come back fully healthy. So th those sort of solutions are something that we, we see as providing the needs for the needs of the consumer, which was never there, which has not been available. So the partnership that we look at with Azuri is very important for us from se several points, is that we are now making it, the consumer aware of what insurance can do for them. We, we are able to now get dist uh, uh, distribute a product which we would have never been able to distribute to the population that we, we would like to go, go into and then create a sustainable model for us to expand the penetration of insurance in this country. Currently, we talk about that insurance is only uh, sort of 3% of the GDP. When you look at South Africa and so on, South Africa is perhaps the most developed, in developed insurance market. Their insurance, uh, they're covering about 14% of the GDP is insurance. In the, in, uh, <coughs> when you look at Kenya, it's 3%, and the 3% is only because we are selling to sort of industries, uh, households, the, which have assets, and uh, property owners, and so on but we are not selling to the rural population. If we can now get into the rural population, and the way we would like to do it is that we would like to really get into the farmers, the rural house owners, we will be able to, we can increase the penetration rate to up to 6% in, in about five years. But we can only do it if we use innovators and the, the product uh, suppliers like Azuri. S Simon, I just wanted you to um, opine on, on what uh, our, our, our two panelists have said. And then I also wanted to ask you about, um, you know, this economic theory which you are, you are knocking. The economic theory was that GDP starts to increase only with density. Um, and proximity, the whole urban e economic, which you're now calling a bit of a myth, uh, a theory, and just expound a little bit on, 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 that, on the points you were making there as well. Yes, thank you very much for that. Um, so, um, if you speak to a striker in Man United, um, and you ask them where he's going to run to, He's not going to run to where the ball is. He's going to run to where the ball is going to be. And it seems to me that in order to be successful in developing the economy of sub-Saharan Africa, we need to do exactly the same thing. So if we look at the trends that have occurred over the last 25, 30 years, what we've seen is a dramatic rise in the power of the individual and a reduction in the power of the corporate. So 25 years ago, individuals uh, found it very difficult to set up businesses, to be able to uh, communicate information. If you wanted to get your news, you had to go to one of the standard news channels. Uh, if you wanted to make a video, you had to go and work, or make a film, you had to go and work for a movie studio and power was held in the hands of a relatively small number of people. What we've seen over the last few years is that power is being returned to the individual, that technology is enabling individuals to do things without having to ask permission from a whole number of different people inside that value chain. And I expect that that is going to be a trend that continues. So the question then is, what does the future economy look like? And I would argue that the future economy looks more individualistic, where individuals have greater choice and greater control over what they do, but at the same time rely on a whole range of different things around them in order to be able to get effectiveness in what they do. So we all know the things that the internet enables us to do that previously we couldn't do. 
If I get lost in the middle of Nairobi, I look on my phone, bring up Google Maps, and it tells me where I am. I don't have to go and find a physical map book to go and tell me where I happen to be. So this combination of individual empowerment and then effectiveness being brought by collaboration between those individuals seems to me to be the way of the future. One of the advantages of being in an economy that is well established is that you have a whole lot of ways of doing things and a whole lot of infrastructure. Actually, in times of change, that becomes a disadvantage. So if you imagine that we didn't have cars today, we would be developing electric cars from the outset. We wouldn't be bothering with petrol cars. We'd go straight to electric cars. But electric cars are fighting an uphill battle because they're fighting 100 years of efficiency and of technology rollout within the economy. And so it's going to take longer for electric cars to roll out because petrol cars exist than they would have rolled out if petrol cars didn't exist. Well, in the sub-Saharan economy point of view, many of those conventional technologies simply don't exist. And so we're seeing that the top six countries in the world for mobile banking are actually based in sub-Saharan Africa. We're seeing many of the trials of drone delivery are happening in sub-Saharan Africa. Many of the trials of e-health and e-education are happening here. So there is a tremendous opportunity for the continent to strike out in new directions and do things in new ways and get advantages from those new ways before conventional economies are able to catch up. And that, to me, is the real opportunity for the continent. Absolutely. Um, you know, thinking about, uh, earlier we were talking, you, uh, Ashok was talking to me about um, Hindustan Lever, uh, Unilever's Indian business, and you said that uh, the transformative moment was when they realized the consumer could not purchase a $20 uh, 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 offering, but could afford it to purchase a $1 offering. And, and that what they call here the Kadogo economy, I think, is the technical term that was given to it. Um, Alex, maybe you, uh, uh, maybe you can just tell us, uh, you know, how, because surely that's the same thing that's applying to Unilever in this region. And in particular, you were describing Ethiopia to me. How does that, ch you know, is, is, is the PayGo model the nirvana to this, or what is it? that unlocked that economy that made sense for, for all three of you are talking to me about that economy, it seems. Um, it's a good question. Um, as, as speaking actually to Ashok, and he's giving me his experience about India um, in the late 90s. Sorry, Anthony. Yeah. Um, I'll give you some interesting information about India. They understand Unilever business. It's been growing double-digit volume growth last 12 years non-stop. Uh, in Unilever, we have something called a growth league, where we, we showcase the top 10 companies by growth. And you understand Lever has been there for 15 years. And the biggest unlock has been the realization that everybody in a country wants to enjoy the best products. Everybody wants the best. So nobody wants to compromise. But the problem is that when you think about accessibility of products, we always think about physical accessibility. Is it distributed in a particular kiosk? But there's a bigger accessibility, which is price accessibility. And that's what Unilever cracked, starting with India. Actually, India for, for Unilever globally has been the template for the Kidogo economy. And they created this one rupee product, where I only have this much, but I want to enjoy uh, to wash my hair with sun silk and it's a single-use sachet. Um, and that's the biggest insight. In Kenya, uh, 45 to 50% of our home care business is in the small sachets. Now, it's not as simple as just making a small sachet and voila. Uh, it's, it's a lot more complex than that because the proportionate cost on a low unit pack is a lot more expensive than a big pack, if you know the dynamics, yeah? The, the proportionate cost of packaging on a low unit pack is bigger than on a big pack. 
Uh, it costs more, there's more handling labor. So it's, it's very challenging to actually create small parks and make a profit out of it. And Unilever has spent lots of time engineering costs out of it and making sure that on top of that you have a distribution net network that reaches the farthest ends of the market because they, they go hand in hand. Um, people in a Carrefour or Naivas in Nairobi don't need the low unit parks. They can afford big parks. It's people in Busia and, and far ends of Kilifi who need it. So as a result, if you, I forgot to your next question is about the pay-go model. It's actually a form of the Kidogo economy, if you think about it. Because I want this big expensive uh, power station in my home. I like the description actually. Um, but I can't afford it paying at once. Um, so what do I do? And Azuri created the, a means for people to actually enjoy the full benefit today. And I think that's the, that's, that's the future. The future here is that we need to think about um, business models that allow access, price access to all the best that the world has to offer to everyone in the, in the world. Um, s just segregating products by socioeconomic class or income levels doesn't work anymore because your growth is going to run out at some point. <coughs> and that's what Unilever tries to do every, every day. When we, think, when we talk about creating a bright future for all Kenyans or all East Africans, you cannot <coughs> create that bright future if your product access is limited. Whether it's price, distribution, uh, you have to find a way of solving it. And you can never solve it on your own or with others. On the Kidogo side, we work with, in some cases, with actually partners. We don't actually make some of those products ourselves. We found people in the market who are much more efficient than making them. You know, this is where you put your pride aside and get it done through collaboration. So it's the way to go. It's not going away. We have to find ways of making it a lot more sustainable and scale it up. A shock on the same point, because it seems to me that <coughs> a huge growth opportunity for you is in sizing your insurance product at the right price for this consumer base that you've described needs your product, but typically would not know about it or even be able to access it from what you previously were describing. Um, <coughs> well, you know, there's something very interesting, uh, the pay-as-you-go model. Um, I think if I ask some of you here, when you have to buy your insurance, what is the amount you have to pay and for how long? And the most of the answer will be that <coughs> we have to pay 10,000 shillings at one go. And uh, now if you are telling somebody in the rural area who doesn't understand insurance at all, they don't know how to you know, purchase it, um, <coughs> Most of the people in rural areas and many in urban areas as well think insurance is for the rich. Now the pay-as-you-go model has uh, done s another thing for us. What it has done is, is that we are now charging the premium in bite size. So the premium, uh, Azuri makes it possible for us to supply that cover to the person. We don't demand that the, it's an annual premium when the claim comes that you must pay the balance of the premium. We go ahead and settle the claim on the basis that we might have only received a month's premium. But the scale that Azuri allows us is that they're selling this product, to uh, offering it to all the consumers. So we are happy to say that, right, the law of large number works and a claim can come after a, m a month after somebody's only paid 25 shillings or 100 shillings for that pr product. But uh, it's, it has actually made it cheap, uh, easier for us to downsize our product, the premium collection. And we don't have to now send people to collect that money. Azuri does it for us. So the partnership for, on pay-as-you models, are, are, you know, pay-as-you-go model, is very important for us, is that because we can now give small covers at small premiums 
but these are in installments of 52 weeks. So it's something that, uh, th that appeals to us. But also the other thing it does is it starts making us think, which are the other products that we should, we should be able to give to our consumers on the same basis? And a rural population is that the more it becomes aware that there is a product available for them, will mean that we will now be able to sell other, other products to them. After the, uh, the hospital cash, the funeral benefit, we could now start ensuring that hut, the manyata, or the small uh, house that they have in the rural area, and we can give them fire cover, which they, we would never be, have been able to go, provide to them. Uh, because what, what it is, is that the location of the property, the type of the property, and how, uh, you know, how much it, it, it must be worth, can be determined for us by Azuri. So if something happens to that house, the claim can come in and we can s settle a household claim for 30,000 shillings for a hut or 100,000 shillings for a stone building. And we don't, we don't even have to send people to go and look at that house. All we need to find out is from Azuri was, was there a fire? So it gives us endless possibilities of expanding the way we can deliver first our product, but secondly, what is more important is how is the claim paid? Because you do, it's the claim that you pay quickly that makes the difference to the person who needs it the most. So, we, so it's, it gives us endless way of doing our, changing our business model. And it will also g make sure that we now create a client base which, under, which realizes that there is insurance is an important product which can look after them, which up till now we were never uh, been able to do. You know, uh, Simon, we, we have a lot of these sort of uh, uh, Mall for Africa, e-commerce websites, and it seems to me that you're like a little bit like that, and you're in the sense that you're giving people um, a window and a selection of products, and, you're, and interestingly, you're, you're not thinking just about your product, you're thinking about the rest of uh, what else can be delivered. And this comes to this big buzzword of sustainability that's always banded around and, have, and, and, and uh, has a lot of power. Uh, and from listening to you, you're obviously creating a sort of new, you're reinventing what's sustainable at that village level. Tell us a little bit about how that word plays with your business and what do you think about what you're trying to build? Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think you know, sustainability is at the heart of, of what we do. Uh, and I think sustainability is something that you can think of in a number of different, uh, different ways. So <clears throat> there's sustainability from the point of view of the planet. You know, do we want to have uh, the nature of development in uh, uh, Africa follow the model of development that has occurred in the West, which frankly has been really quite disrupt, uh, disrupt, uh, destructive? Or should we try to step to a new development model which is inherently sustainable and will inherently benefit uh, the, the, the environment uh, around us? But there is also the economic sustainability. And uh, I think that one of the things that has really struck me over the last few years is the way that the thought process around these sorts of uh, capabilities has changed. So when you spoke in 2010 about individuals in rural households, people were often described as beneficiaries or uh, grantees or whatever it may be. Today, we're not thinking of individuals in that sort of term. We're thinking of individuals as individual consumers who sit on a level playing field with other, uh, uh, other people within the country. And so in order to make that sustainable, you've got to make it into a commercial proposition. 
There's a guy called Paul Polak who famously said, you can't donate your way out of poverty. It doesn't matter how much money you spend, you'll never solve the problem unless you actually create an ecosystem that works. And the only ecosystem that we know that works is commerce and business. And so by providing something which works with local partners, which works with local people, that creates a supply chain that employs many, many thousands of people in order to create a business that works. That ensures that we have long-term sustainability. And so in five years' time or 10 years' time or 15 years' time, when the Azuri customer wants to be able to get a new product or a new service or to repair the product that they've got, we can be sure that we will have people there that enable that to continue for the long term rather than simply being something that people buy now and then uh, in a year or two's time are not able to work with. So sustainability of business model is critical and critically as we've talked about earlier on this morning, this is not something that Azuri can do on its own and Azuri has no ambition to do on our own. We see this as a partnership, a partnership with uh, the suppliers and a partnership with our customers in order to collectively build a new type of economy in sub-Saharan Africa. So it, it's a grand vision, it's an important vision, but I think when you sit down and think about it, people realize that actually it's a realistic vision, it's an achievable vision. And we've already demonstrated over the last seven years that we've made tremendous progress along that road and we expect that progress to continue for the foreseeable future. I'm conscious that we've got to get to the Q&A and I'm sure people have got a lot of questions. Uh, so I wanted to give you each an opportunity to answer a three-sided question. Is Africa rising, in your opinion? Right. Um, what has been your most difficult challenge in terms of riding that wave, I assume you're going to be telling me. And individually, what is, you're all innovating in a very interesting area, what is the proudest moment for you? I might, shall I end with you, Simon? Sure. And we'll, get, we'll start with Anthony. Doesn't that give me a lot of time to think. You've been telling me that you're absolutely everywhere from Rwanda to deep, deep uh, undercover in Ethiopia. So you've got a great perspective. What do you think of that question? It's an interesting question because um, I'll give a, a, an example. Uh, three years ago, uh, Unilever had this Africa strategy, and it was actually called Africa Rising, uh, coincidence. And the idea was a bit of what Simon said. Let's pump in a lot of money into... Uh, into Africa, build factories and all that stuff, yeah? Uh, guess what? We did all of that and nothing happened. Um, so the biggest learning we got was that what we needed to do was get a lot under the skin of how do we grow Africa. So when we changed tact and started um, localizing our approach, getting on the ground, because often these things are run from a boardroom in London, people signing off on capital expenditure, if people flying in here to tell you what to do. But when we started actually um, getting Africans involved, um, three, four years ago, there would be no Kenyan sitting here as marketing director of Unilever, as hazard as it's, 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 it is to admit. We've now changed all of that. The Africa exec is now 80% Africa. We've got five years of continuous growth, beating expectations in Africa for Unilever, including last year. So the insight has been get on the ground, get Africans involved. And what we realized through that process is that Africans know what good is, what world class is um, from, a, from, a, from a mental stand standpoint. The biggest difference is that we do not have the opportunities. So when I think about Africa rising, I think it is from a mental standpoint. We've got the demographic dividend. Uh, 
We've got the fastest growth of information access technology per capita in the world, if there was such a ratio. So yes, it is rising, but it needs to be accelerated, matched with more opportunities. Um, I can see that. Uh, so I, I handle Ethiopia, for example. I was telling Ali, we are doubling the business every six to seven months <laughs> in Ethiopia. Um, so Africa isn't poor. Um, you, you've heard all the good stories from Abi, the PM there. He's an amazing guy. I've met him in many forums, but he, he gets it. <laughs> so that guy gets it. Um, we don't need donations. We just need this kind of thought, thoughts incubated across Africa, and the rest will, will be history. And it, there's a lot of politics there, but Africa is rising. So the second question was, what's my biggest challenge? My biggest challenge, I think, has been to, in my career, I think, with Unilever, <coughs> has been to try and what we call create I would say create a Unilever business in Africa. So, because often um, the measure of success in an organization like Unilever that is so integrated in the rest of the world is of, say, Europe, etc. And it's a very different business. So trying to explain that um, my business has to run in a very different way, with a different model, to someone sitting in London who runs the global business, it's my biggest challenge at the moment. Um, it's easier maybe for Ashok who runs a <laughs> business in Kenya, but it's very difficult for me. I mean, so this partnership, for example, uh, and another one I'm doing with Mr. Green, and I just launched some initiatives in Rwanda last week. It's very difficult uh, to actually explain how I can create an African business in Africa for Africa, wh whereas I'm measured by a Unilever global standard. Uh, I'm getting there now. We're getting there. But that's, I think I would say, it's my biggest challenge. Um, my proudest moment, um, I think, has been uh, convincing Unilever in East Africa to invest in the right way across my business. So just to give you context, and I keep talking about Ethiopia because it's a very big one. Um, yes, 100 million people, but nobody is really successful there. Tanzania as well, very big. So I've, I've managed to convince Unilever to invest close to over 20 to 25 million euros in the next three years across Uganda, Tanzania, and Ethiopia. So working day and night, traveling like, a, like crazy. But I, I would say that's my proudest moment. I'm actually commissioning a factory next month in, in Addis, um, building a new one across the region. So I would say that's my biggest moment, proudest moment. But it's not just about building the stuff. It's what I spoke about <laughs> initially. How do, we, how do I convince a global organization that an African business can be successful within Unilever, running run the African way? And that's the biggest challenge, creating like-minded partnerships and run very locally by Africans. So that's, it's a, if it's chat with me after this, maybe I'll explain a bit more, but it's a, it's a very big, it's a difficult challenge if you work in a multinational organization like Unilever. It consumes a lot of your time, but once, once you're successful, it's amazing. Answer other questions? Yeah. Uh, sure. <coughs> Is Africa rising? And then the, the, um, your most difficult challenge and your proudest moment. Um. If you seriously look at Africa, and to me, uh, I seriously look at uh, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, and the way, we, the way we have grown. Uh, Africa is rising. It's got its own challenges, and it's, uh, but the, the, the thing is, it's in the last five, 10 years, if you see the way African economies have moved, they've really moved, uh, in such a way that a lot of overseas interest has come in, a lot of uh, overseas money is coming in to put into Africa to, 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 to take, uh, you know, to earn from Africa what they, they never saw in Africa. So, like, for example, what's happened is, is that um, 
if you look at uh, APA and Apollo, they are homegrown companies. Um, we never had, we, we, we did not rely on an overseas partner to, to sustain us and make, uh, bring us to where we are. But when an overseas partner saw that uh, we were doing so well, they actually approached us and they said, could we buy shares in this, uh, in, in your organization? So the world's second largest reinsurer invested in uh, Apollo and APA, uh, and they have owned 27%. But it is, the management is still African. We are an African company, and we believe that the rise, because Africa is rising, we are growing with it. And from a very small company, we are now one of the largest in the region. So that, that shows that uh, Africa has got the potential. It has been rising, and we are, we are growing with, as Africa grows, we are growing with it. And especially when you look at Kenya, Kenya has uh, de developed its economy much faster than any of our, uh, our, the, our regional neighbors. So that is where we, we have, uh, you know, we cut our teeth there, and we are making sure that uh, we stay on top uh, because of the rising. The challenges, there are many challenges. Um, the biggest challenge that we are facing uh, as an industry is that uh, the awareness of insurance is not there. The, the majority of people do not understand insurance, or if they do understand insurance, there are a lot of, lot of them who do not trust insurance. Because why should you pay money now for a paper which is just a promise. It's not a tangible product. So how do you make sure that the person understands uh, insurance? So awareness of insurance is a big problem. The second area that is hitting us almost every day is corruption and fraud. And that's, that, that is one of the biggest challenges that we, we find. And thirdly, I think it affects each one of us, is the leadership. If our leadership was changing in a different way, then what would happen is, is that we would suddenly find that Kenya's uh, GDP would not be growing at 6% or so. We could be growing at 9%, 10%. Th that's possible for Kenya. But it's the leadership that has to change, the corruption has to, we have to contain it. So that's the, one of the biggest challenges that we have. We are faced with it all the time, and uh, we have to contain it. Achievements, um, as a homegrown company, 99% of our, our employees are Kenyan born. And that's something that we can say. We got a lot of uh, foreign, uh, foreign um, investors coming in for, a lot of our competitors have been taken over by foreign uh, insurance companies, big, uh, big names and so on. And yet they cannot penetrate the market. So there must be something that we are doing which is very good. But our greatest achievement as, as Apollo and APA was many years ago when nobody wanted to insure HIV positive people. We were the first ones who were said we will go and insure them. And for about eight years, nobody, in fact, even, even nobody gave that product to the clients. So for eight years, we had that market share. For, for that part of the business. But our biggest achievement right now is, is that what we have started doing is for the microinsurance and for the uh, rural population, is that by bringing insurance covers to that, that part of our economy and part of our population which would never have benefited from, uh, fr from uh, insurance. So what is happening is that the achievement that we are really can count on is that what uh, started off at Apollo as a CSR activity in trying to take, you know, giving products to the rural population is now starting to grow. And we are now seeing that we are able to sustain that part of our business. We can actually put more money into our microinsurance and our agriculture products which we were never able to. We would not have been able to convince our, our board to put in 
a hundred million or two hundred million shillings in that part of our business. But right now, that's what we are able to do. So the achievement that we have really been able to do is that we have been able to product bring innovative products, which will help the marketplace and at the same time help the population uh, live through those financial shocks or through that be able to risk, uh, you know, provide management for the risks that they were never able to. Thank you. Um, so, Africa's rising. Mm. Africa, if you think back a bit, where did Africa's rising come from? Well it, well, it became sort of popularized by a front page article on The Economist. And uh, interestingly, it followed an article a few years earlier which said that Africa was a basket case and was never going to succeed. And both of those are wrong in the extreme. So the notion of Africa rising sent a message to uh, mainly, frankly, Western organizations that there was kind of an El Dorado, there was a gold rush, there was something that people needed to dive into and to, uh, to change in the short term. And I think what has occurred over the last two or three years is a much more balanced view of uh, the opportunity. Absolutely, African subcontinent is a land of potential. There is huge, huge potential in the continent. But I don't think anybody is under any misapprehension that it's going to be a lot of hard work to get that potential to be realized. And it's not something that is going to occur instantly. So is Africa rising? Absolutely, Africa is rising. But is Africa rising in a sort of get-rich-quick type of way? No, it's not. But that's a good thing. That means that the continent is developing in a sustainable way, which is really going to benefit everybody, rather than just a few very highly paid individuals uh, that you might have uh, I within a particular country. So looking on to the, the, the next steps with that, what have been our biggest challenges? The, the, the biggest challenge for an organization like Azuri is the gap between where we are today and where the opportunity is. The number of people who are off-grid in sub-Saharan Africa is absolutely huge. And companies like Azuri and APA and Unilever are bringing dramatically different, disruptively different approaches to addressing the market. And those sorts of capabilities take time to diffuse into the market. So the challenge is the gap between uh, the aspirations of people like ourselves uh, to be able to roll things out instantly and the reality that you have to build these things sustainably bottom up to really be able to go and deliver it. In terms of the two proudest moments, I think I would say there are two. The first one is that this has been a homegrown achievement. If you look at the uh, employees of Azuri and Azuri's partners, between Azuri and our partners, we have something like 2,000 individuals who are involved in selling um, uh, and, and developing uh, these sorts of solar products. 27 of those are based in Cambridge, England. So this is something which has really been developed locally by local individuals providing employment, skills, knowledge, and really meeting the needs of, of local people. The second one, I think, is to look back to where we were in 2010. So, Sometimes when you're involved in these industries, you, you see everything incrementally, and, and actually it's sometimes interesting to look back. In 2010, the state of the art was a single solar lamp about the size of that glass. And individual households would have a single solar lamp that would light an area about the size of that table. Today, we're able to offer a television with 60 channels of, t of content 20 channels of radio, a torch, uh, 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 lighting, 
uh, phone charging, smartphones, a whole variety of devices which would look absolutely at home in New York or London or Johannesburg or any other major city in the world. In other words, we're not providing a technology which is substandard technology to individuals who are in low-income houses. We're providing technology that is absolutely up to the state of the art that you would expect in any household anywhere in the world. And I think that change of mindset that rural low-income households are 100% valuable individuals and deserve to have 100% valuable products that are of the same standard that people get anywhere else in the world is a really key transformation and something that I think personally I'm very proud of. Thank you very, very much to the panel for really uh, uh, very, very uh, engrossing conversation and I thank you all and really it's been a pleasure to take this uh, a journey with you today and learn about the way you're thinking about such a key component of the economy. Your figure for the informal economy, if remind me, you said it was about 80%. About 75% of the Kenyan economy and about 90% of the economy. That's incredible. And, and really taking us with this deep dive into it. I'd like to throw it open to questions. Um, and then we're going to finish up with a very uh, dramatic product launch, aren't we? So uh, I, I think I'll take it from the audience first, if I may. Okay, my name is Mark Ambito. I'm a social entrepreneur, but I'm also an economist. And uh, my question is basically to the three, three speakers, and mostly to Simon. Uh, is the question about the egg and the chicken, <laughs> the hen. And it comes like this. You said about the rural households in Africa per se, that initially there was aspect of beneficiaries, and grantees that used to be the main thing. I, as somebody who has stayed a lot in Asia, especially India, and has worked also in Kenya a lot, uh, there's a lot of poverty in Kenya in the rural areas. And for your product, I've seen the costs that you are charging it for. Uh, the main important thing for the three speakers is that the income household, the income level of the household in the rural areas has to be actually elevated. That's why impact investors have really taken root in Asia to support individual entrepreneurs to come up with scalable ideas. And companies like you, Unilever, Apollo, have really supported these individuals, as I say, the power lives of the individuals. I want to know what the three speakers, their companies are doing specifically to support the individual that can come out in the rural areas to set up enterprises, not specifically social enterprise, but any enterprise that can actually make you people have maybe about a hundred people who can buy your products and utilize them. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Modoni and um, I'm a human resource management um, professional. But my question is, um, first of all, there's a comment. I hope Azuri will go public um, one of these fine years. That would be great stock to buy. So, so <laughs> we're also going to address that over the next few days because okay. I completely agree with you. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and in part, that's one of the reasons that I wanted to hold this and to get everybody interested in that prospect mm -hmm. because it's an enormous one. Anyway, sorry to interrupt you. No problem. Um, so I, I believe well-run uh, companies um, are a key to unlocking a lot of economic potential. And we always see that um, economic collapse is often associated with poor management practices. So I'm curious uh, across the panel, and um, I applaud you for hiring a, a lot of um, African talent to run strategies. But in particular, um, what are the unique people management styles and um, operational practices you apply in your individual companies to get the results that you're enjoying today? I suspect that might be answered differently by different people because Unilever, long established, um, Simon, faster growth, Apollo, exploring these fast growth markets. But sorry, we'll take one more question. Your name? 
I'm Dennis. Mokaba. Dennis. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Simon, for such a wonderful presentation. As I listened to you, I couldn't help but remember growing up in the rural area where we would go uh, to a very long distance to have, you know, our mobile phone get power. And this was more so to the shopping centers, which were quite a distance. And, and therefore, I applaud you for such a very interesting uh, innovation. Talking about mobile phones, about two weeks ago, I read a very interesting development that is a particular a person came up with an innovation whereby you can switch on and off your electricity in your homestead using a mobile phone that is with a text message. Have you incorporated this in Azuri or is it something you would want to push into your, your R&D department? Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'm um, happy to pick that one up. So. Um, yeah, I think um, these, the economies, as, as, as we know, are, are driven by entrepreneurship. And one of the challenges in the early days of microfinance was uh, that um, <clears throat> individuals would be given some money to be able to go and invest in a business. But all the cards were stacked against them. So you're making local goods, but you don't have DHL who can go and deliver those goods for. You don't even have an address that you can go and uh, collect them from and so on. So those businesses were um, finding it very difficult to be able to, to grow in, in that way. Um, by bringing the sorts of technologies that we're talking about, bringing internet technologies, bringing accessibility communication, then that is enabling these sorts of entrepreneurial activities. So I talked a bit earlier about the, uh, the Boda drivers. Uh, we have many retailers who keep their stores open later at night. We have individuals who are using their smartphones to change the way that they grow crops uh, to be able to get higher value crops and be able to sell those at higher prices into, into different markets and so on. So you know, Azuri is an enabling technology um, and rather like mobile phones, we do a particular job but individuals use that technology to do a vast array of things that we couldn't possibly individually uh, go and do. And so, yes, I think you know, we're very delighted with the way that people are picking up this technology and using it to develop entrepreneurship and to be able to in increase incomes uh, uh, across the country. Um. It's an interesting question is how to make sure that people have a sustainable income. Um, as uh, APA and Apollo, there's uh, two initiatives that we have done. We started piloting pastoralist insurance cover uh, about in 2010. And uh, the pastoralist insurance cover is, is for the mostly the pastoralists that are in northern Kenya. And what happens to them is, is that uh, we have s that part of the Kenya, does, it's basically semi-arid. The, uh, the lack of water, the lack of rainfall, etc., does not give them enough forage. The, and their wealth is in their cattle. So we, have t we, we, haven't, we tied up with Ilri and we started marketing pastoralist cover to the to the pastoralists in northern Kenya, and what what we do there is is that we d we do not cover the animal for death or anything else. What we do is is we co cover the uh, the forage on the ground, and the forage on the ground is measured by satellites, and as the uh, as the season goes on, the dry season increases the satellite tells us how much forage is there on the ground and as soon as the forage is below 20 percent then we, we we declare a payout it's a trigger and we declare a payout and the pastoralists will be told that you will be paid so much money for the you know immediately that will they can then now go and buy uh, food uh, you know food stock for their animals to to live on 
So the idea is is that uh, the end, the pastoralist is able to sustain the animal and make sure until the next next uh, rains come and the forage now grow, grows again. So that is one area that uh, the past uh, you know we are able to now give the pastoralist a sustainable income. But the other journey that we started is the APA and Apollo was the one for the farmer, the smallholder farmers in the re rest of Kenya. Uh, we started off with weather index insurance and we went to the farmers and we said that if there was a lack of rainfall and your crop failed because of the lack of rainfall, we will then provide you with, uh, with money to, uh, that would have to, you know, been, been your yield. But the problem that we started having was that we were using, we have to use aggregators. Azuri is an aggregator for us. So similarly, the, we went to the banks and we told the banks that we are now cover, covering this. But the banks took out that insurance for the loan that they gave to the farmer. The farmer never knew that there was cover uh, for them. And the bank was only, if there was a crop failure and if there was a payout by us, then it was the loan that was covered, but not the balance of the uh, farmer's uh, yield. Uh, but we also saw that with weather index, we, you know, the farmer did not understand it, uh, and it was only covering one peril that would affect their crop. So we developed over the years now, we have developed area yield in index insurance. Area yield in index insurance for a farmer does two things. It covers every peril, uh, whether it's weather or whether it is uh, infestation or other ways of destru destruction of the crop, except for army worm. So a farmer is guaranteed 80% of the yield of their, of their farm. And that means that uh, as soon as uh, you know, we declare the harvest is done, and we know that the yield has been below 80%, we will immediately pay the farmer the difference. So now a farmer in Kenya can always have an 80% yield from their farm, which changes their, their, their livelihood. In the old days, they didn't have cover, so when, when the crop failed, they were, they, they were left, left in poverty. Now we can, any farmer can know that if they are insured, for the AYII cover, they will get 80%. And that will sustain them, their livelihood and increase their income. So once you are assured of a constant income, you can now start doing other things. You can make sure that your family is well taken care of. And our next uh, hope is, is that we will be able to help that farmer mechanize the farm. And also, as they mechanize, the production grows the children will now start thinking about farming as an income generating acti activity and not come to towns to, uh, you know and live here in you know try to look for work in towns and cities so that's something that we, you know is our dream that we will be able to through area yield insur index insurance we will in fact increase the productivity of the farmer and income of the farmer Anthony. Yes. Um, so two, I'm going to tackle two questions. I'm actually very passionate about both. Maybe the second one a bit more. Um, the first one was around the egg and chicken. It's a very interesting question. So I start by saying I think we all agree no organization has embodied sustainability like Unilever globally. Yeah? And Paul Polman has driven it very aggressively over his tenure, last 10 years. And Alan Job, the new CEO, is actually picking it up. And he's defining it around three things. Businesses with purpose, last. Brands with purpose, grow. People with purpose, thrive. So sustainability is the agenda, but it's espoused in what we call our business purpose, which is creating a bright future for all Kenyans, East Africans, etc., wherever you are. And it's an interesting question because you can only sell, 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 but if people are not healthy, they won't be able to use your products. You can only do so much in the trade. If people do not have capital or money, they will not be able to actually run the businesses to keep the kiosks open, etc. 
you, you get. So it, it's sort of a virtual cycle. And I, and I can give you examples of what Unilever is doing. It's a very uh, active uh, uh, drive by Unilever. I, I run a lot, actually a lot of them within Unilever. One is even the Azuri one. So the Azuri partnership helps to scale up um, the business by tapping into this over 60,000 uh, distribution points we have in Kenya. If we manage to do that, that business becomes exponentially bigger, but also you're creating completely new uh, revenue streams for people at the grassroots. So you can see how that works. Um, the other one is a, pro a program we call Jazaduka, which is a, a microfinance lending um, initiative with MasterCard that actually helps give small dukas a bit more, lend them more money so they can scale up their business. The other one you might be familiar with, it, with the, is with On Plastic, partnership we have with Mr. Green, which is actually a social business where we say we, we get waste pickers to collect plastic that can be recycled. So creating value that from a place that didn't actually exist. So plastic has a lot of value and we want to be PCR neutral in around, I think, three or four years. So these are just a few examples of how we're trying to tackle the egg and chicken thing question. Because you're going to run out of runway if you're running your business in a traditional way. You've got to make it sustainable. People have got to be healthy. So what we've actually done is two parts. We're creating, we don't just sell. We call it selling with a purpose, which is a bit of what I've described. But we also have purposeful brands. So each of Unilever brands has to create a bright future for someone. And I'll give you two very polar examples. Lifeboy might be easier, right? Hygienic, yeah, helps five million kids reach the age five. That's easy to understand, right? But if you go to say a brand like Dove, beauty product, how does that drive purpose? But we actually found that, and women will understand that Helping women understand that they are beautiful just as they are actually helps drive their esteem and makes them more productive. And that's the purpose example on a brand like Dove. You can see how the polar opposites, but still drive the same purpose message. And we've realized that brands with purpose built in at their core grow three times faster than brands without. Yeah? No, three times faster than brands without. It's like statistical, uh, actual data from our performance. Now to your question about what's the most effective management styles that p uh, get the best out of today, one thing we realize is that at the heart of every high performing organization is people. Of course, that's like, everybody knows that, right? But then wh what about people? And we can go through all manner of management styles and things, but nothing actually matters if you do not get people to discover what their true purpose is. We don't actually, in Unilever, we do not give people jobs. We give people careers. And their career has to be linked intrinsically with uh, something that they think uniquely they give to the world. So everybody in Unilever has to discover their purpose. We spend a lot of money getting people to discover their purpose and leave it. So I'll give you an example. Um, I used to work at Unilever. I worked for two years, left, went to sell beer. Yet I don't drink, but I came back to Unilever because I, I realized that what I tasted at Unilever was actually a lot more fulfilling than working at EABL. And that's why I came back. And I drive that purpose initiative in Unilever very aggressively. And one thing we discovered is that when, peop when personal growth exceeds business growth, then the business will grow. So we actually want people to grow faster than the business. And we have all manner of metrics. Are you growing at 20%? Then the business will grow at 25%. You cannot, your business cannot grow at a faster rate than the people are growing. So that's just an idea of how I would answer your question. Um, I, I, I would like to turn to the, the question that Muthoni was posing, which I think is a, was a very interesting question about managing personnel, managing uh, uh, you know a team um, as you grow. And I think Simon, this would really apply. You described 
2010, you said it was one single solar lamp. Today, I think you got 300,000 of your systems deployed. Um, uh, and possibly that's happened much, it's been a bit of a J curve. So I think, how, how do you respond to what Muthoni was posing? Yes, I, What's I, the source? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very good question. Um, so, so, you know, as Anthony mentioned, you know, all businesses are based on human capital and that's the thing that drives, uh, drives all businesses. Um, you know, there, there are, you know, individuals in Africa are no different to individuals around the world. You know, the fundamentals are all exactly the same. Um, but I think there are two things that we particularly focus on uh, which, which helps. Um, the, the first one is aspiration. So people's aspirations tend to be bounded by the environment that they're in. And one of the things that we try to do is to encourage people to think beyond those traditional boundaries, to think about being able to extend their capabilities uh, be, beyond the, you know, yeah. when, when I was a kid, um, up in the north of England, if you lived in a coal mining village, your life was defined as you were going to go down the coal mine. That was it, right? Your aspiration was limited at, at that point. Um, there have been times, and probably still are, where if you grow up in a village, your role in life is going to become, um, um, you know, if you're a woman in a village, to become a mother and a subsistence farmer, and that's it. And so by being able to provide aspiration to people, it allows people to, uh, to break out of those traditional molds um, and, and to look at other things uh, that they may be able to do. The other thing is a sense of ownership and a sense of empowerment. So it's all very well to have an aspiration to be president of the country, but if you don't have any stepping stones that you can take to get you in that direction, it remains a pipe dream. And so one of the key things is to provide that environment that gives people those stepping stones, enables people to be able to move up a level, reassess their aspirations, up a level, reassess their aspirations, and continue that process. So I think that's something that is uh, key in the way that we, uh, that we try to work in, in all the countries we work in. I'm conscious of that, that, that we've got a time limit, so I'm just going to jump now to, a, we're going to answer your question, but I've, I know you've been keen to ask one, so I'll take two more questions. Then we got an unveiling, and part of the attraction of this particular forum, I like to believe, is that you have access to the individuals here, and I suggest I guillotine it after that, and then if you've got burning questions, you come and engage individually and use this opportunity, because I think all three are, sh uh, are offering up some very interesting and long-term sustainable opportunities. Your name? Yeah, my name is Zia Siddiqui. I'm from WaveTech, we are a technology company. Uh, a question to first to Simon is, uh, how do you find risks involved in this pay-as-you-go model? Because uh, looking at the poverty level of the rural areas, uh, there's, there's always a chance that people will stop paying and, uh, and then they might continue as well and some might not. So how do you find it during this uh, span where, where you've gone to so many households? And uh, to Mr. Ashok, uh, regarding the, you told us about the awareness. Uh, insurance has been always a challenge of awareness and people paying and uh, realizing the, that factor. So in rural areas, that's again a big question of, about awareness and paying for something against a promise. So how do you, uh, a, how are you able to handle that? So can you repeat that question again? The awareness, you said that the insurance sector has always been that uh, uh, people are unaware of, like in, um, in the main cities or main uh, countries, developed markets, it's easier to sell insurance, whereas rural areas, it is very difficult uh, to make them aware. And the other thing is that uh, with, the, with the Azuri model, I mean, uh, it's just a replacement, probably in terms of the cost involved, because as you mentioned that uh, on a weekly basis, they're spending some money towards uh, having the phone charged or, or light buying candles. 
but at the same time, they replace that cost with the, with the technology, and maybe there's no additional cost involved in getting the technology. But in case of insurance, there's an additional cost. So how do you, uh, how, how are you able to uh, convey that message and make the rural population aware about it? Thank you. Hello, my name is Steve. I am involved in project management and design. My question goes to Mr. Simon. And for rural homes, this is for the homes. How about for the schools, for example? If like we want to run a library, we want to run the school, the security lights and all that, how, how, do, you, how do you integrate that in the, manage, in the payment system? Then my other question is, in the plan that I've seen for the payment, do I have to make like a down payment, for example, of 10,000, and then after that I start paying, or do I just pay the weekly payment and then I have the system installed? How, you, how is that? Thank you. Okay. Um, very good, okay. So uh, let, let me tackle all of those questions uh, quite quickly. Um, so so the, the, the last question from the, the, the previous uh, group was, about um, essentially smart metering. So uh, would you use a smartphone to be able to turn the electricity on and off remotely? Um, that's actually a fascinating example of the difference between conventional technology and modern technology. So with solar power, your energy is free. You don't need to turn it off. It's only with Ken Power that you need to turn it off because they're the guys who are going to be charging you money for the amount that you go and use. So actually, we don't need to do that because the sun is free. Um, so uh, the, 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 the question about risks. Um, yes, absolutely right. I mean, this is a, uh, a risk management business. And, and when we started, um, I had endless investors who told me, Simon, you're doomed. Um, everybody is uh, very smart around here. Within five minutes, they're going to have hacked into your system, uh, bypassed uh, the payment mechanism, and uh, you'll be bankrupt within a week. Um, and that doesn't happen. And why doesn't it happen? Well, it doesn't, it, the reason it doesn't happen is not an accident. It's really two reasons. One is that people really value the capability that we're bringing to those individuals. We're making a step change in the capabilities of households and people really value that. <coughs> the second one is that we work with uh, distribution mechanisms that reach right the way down into the village. We have individuals in the village who know your village chief, they know the elders in the village, they know where you come from, frankly. Um, and so uh, there is a lot of uh, social and moral pressure apart from economic pressure uh, to um, uh, to, to uh, not um, sort of tamper or, uh, in, in other ways, uh, wave poorly. Um, and what we found is that broadly our repayment rates are on a same par or slightly better than microfinance as, a, as an aggregate. So although it's very difficult to figure out the credit risk of an individual consumer, it's actually relatively straightforward to figure out the credit risk of 10,000 consumers. And so we work on that aggregate credit risk uh, basis. And using the data we have from them, we've been able to secure uh, the sort of capital uh, that, that we've been um, uh, talking about. In terms of larger installations for things like schools, hospitals, so on and so forth, uh, really two answers to that. So absolutely, there are schools uh, that use our systems um, for, for lighting, for televisions, and so on. Um, but this is an absolutely huge market, and um, Azuri can't uh, or doesn't want to be serving every single consumer from the rural consumer right the way to factories and, uh, uh, and, and plants and so on and so forth. So we've chosen to focus at the household level. We think that's where we can have the biggest impact. 
Um, there are other companies that make bigger systems and you know, some of those would be very appropriate. But certainly where there are rural schools and smaller schools and smaller hospitals, clinics and so on, then absolutely people use uh, Azuri technology in those environments. Okay. <coughs> well, there's another thing good about solar power is, is that you don't have to rely on Kenya power. Because when, when the power goes off and you call them to come and repair it, it can take hours. So at least with uh, solar, you don't have to worry about that. Um, okay, awareness. Uh, one of the, th you know, one of the biggest challenge that we have to grow our business in the rural area, or even in the urban area, places like the, uh, you know, K Kibera, Kangemi, etc., is awareness. Insurance is not understood well. Um, we have not sold it well. And we have not really gone out and told people the benefits of insurance. We assume that you know what insurance will do for you. Uh, so what, what we have embarked on, and this is the area I talked about that we are, we are expanding on microinsurance and agriculture insurance uh, is, and livestock insurance to tell people what insurance can do for them and why are they paying a premium for a piece of paper and that they will get something only when the challenge takes place. So the models that we, we are now trying to use are that um, for a rural population, we are trying to bundle. If you are covering uh, a crop, we are trying to bundle with it some, you know, some other cover, like for the person, for the farmer, in case the farmer is, uh, you know, we might have covered the crop, but we will also see, see if we can put in some hospital cash or funeral benefit and so on, and then try to make the farmer aware of it. So they have a larger cover uh, which uh, they can benefit. Because you only understand the value of insurance if there is a claim. And sometimes uh, it's better for us to look at a farmer and say that there is a borderline area, then we would pay that claim so that the farmer has understood it. But with Azuri, the model is, uh, you know, we are relying on Azuri to go out there and sell our product. So we have to train the Azuri staff as to understand what the product is. But at the same time, what we have created is we have created literature. Uh, we've created pamphlets and so on, which the per, the person who has taken the Azuri system will understand the cover that has been provided and also how to c claim. But there's also another part of the cover that the, f the person will not be aware of is we have also ensured the equipment, like something like the television. So if the television has a, if it breaks, falls down or whatever, children are playing and they hit the television, they just have to take it to the Azuri uh, center or say, give it to the Azuri person in that area and it is sent to the center here and the claim is assessed by Azuri themselves, not by APA. So what would happen is, is then they can replace the television immediately. So the, the idea is, is that the person should not suffer. but. That, that's the sort of things that we would like to do all the time w with the claimants. So wherever we have aggregators uh, and where we have sold insurance, pro we have given insurances. We're, we're insuring about 300,000 farmers through uh, another organization and they have got funeral cover uh, for the farmers. Now, that funeral cover is all advice, adv you know, the awareness is done by the aggregator but even the claim settlement is done by the aggregator so that what happens is that if there is a bereavement in family and the aggregator knows that there is a bereavement they will settle the claim from a pool of funds that we have given them so the awareness is we're trying to build awareness in many many different ways uh, but <coughs> what it is is I said by building the awareness, we also want them to understand that the product that we are giving them has a guarantee at the end.
Um, yeah, maybe on the awareness, uh, one of the things that is an aspect of the partnership we have with Azuri is that we're actually going to, we're, we're, we're carrying out joint marketing activities. So, and it's, and it's very, you think like, why are you not only advertising sunlight powder? So I'm actually driving marketing campaigns with Azuri on the ground um, to drive awareness on the product. And I think I was just chatting with Ashok. I'm going to pick it up with him how we also actually drive awareness on the insurance products and maybe extend it to the, to the Duca owners as well. Because I think there's a big benefit. Because remember, once you create that virtual cycle, then all of our businesses thrive. Once people know that there's a lot more to this than just selling products, then you scale up your business significantly. So that's the only thing we're going to drive as well. I, I'd, li I'd like to now give uh, uh, Simon the opportunity to make some closing remarks ahead of uh, Sneha unveiling the latest, uh, 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 unveiling a big surprise. Simon, it's been a really fascinating journey, and I must say, I've, I've you know, I've, I've learned a, a great deal from what you've been talking about. Um, I come from the financial side, obviously, and what's interested me is also the financial prospect of of Azuri. But I'd like you to make your closing remarks, um, please. Uh, so I think the, the the first thing I'd like to do is to thank all of you for coming and. Uh, and engaging so so well with us uh, this this morning, um, the, the the topics that we're discussing uh, uh, this morning are are actually quite mind bending. When you sit down, and you think about all the potential opportunities that can arise from this new technology. Um, every time you think of one, it leads to another. It leads to another. It leads to another. So, I think. There is tremendous excitement about what can be done with the application of technology to really change lives and to really change uh, e economies. And we're um, very excited about that. At the same time, we have to uh, blend that with the realities on the ground of delivering this technology. And so our mission collectively, everybody in this room, not just Azuri, and uh, APA and uh, Unilever is to figure out how we can take these tremendous opportunities that are becoming available and really use those to change the lives of millions and millions of people. So I'd like to thank you all very much for coming. It's been a tremendously uh, uh, beneficial session and uh, we're looking forward to the next 10 years of transformational change in Africa. Thank you. I'd also uh, like to uh, reiterate that. Thank you, Simon, for making the time to come and engage with us. Please use this opportunity at the end if you want to go and uh, explore anything with Simon. I'd like to thank Ashok for a really um, insightful look at the cutting edge of the insurance market where, where you're currently seeking to operate. I'd like to, I'd like to thank you too, Anthony, for, for coming in I think there's a mind speak for both of you to come and tell us a little bit about more about what you guys are doing. But what I enjoyed most was this sort of the way you're making one plus one plus one equal more than three. I think that's re really an interesting uh, uh, way of going about things. So thank you all for being such great guests today. I think I've got to hand the floor over to my friend Sneha over here who's, who's proudly wearing his Azuri t-shirt. Um, and who's going to do some top-level unveiling, I believe. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ali Khan. Um, he had told me that the age range of people coming to MindSpeak is 18 to 35, but I think looking at the room today, it's closer to 18 than, than 35. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and thank you to Ali Khan's team uh, to organize this uh, wonderful session, and thank you to all of you uh, to be here to sacrifice your Saturday morning uh, to do something uh, intellectual. Um, and normally we do product launches when uh, we have some big VIPs uh, here. Uh, unfortunately, they couldn't make it on a Saturday, so we're honored to, to unveil this surprise uh, in front of uh, all of you, the, the future of, uh, of Kenya. 
Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Snehar Shah. I run uh, East Africa for Azuri. So Simon dreams in Cambridge and uh, we make it uh, happen here. Um, in terms of innovation, you've heard, uh, we've had many firsts. We were one of the pioneers of uh, Paygo technology uh, in, 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 in this world. Uh, we were the first ones to introduce a four light system. Uh, everybody else was doing the small lamps, the two lights, the three lights. If you look at a typical uh, African home, uh, you know, they, they live like all of us. They will have a living room, which needs light. They will have a kitchen to cook, which needs light. They have a couple of bedrooms, uh, which needs light, uh, including for children to, to study. Uh, they need light for, for security, so we were the ones who, who changed the, the game uh, by having the four lights. We also made our products very affordable um, because we are the only ones still in the market who are providing our lighting system where a customer does not pay any deposit uh, and they pay as little as uh, 50 shillings a day and they can get going uh, to, to have uh, this light. Uh, Azuri was the first uh, company in the world uh, to in introduce uh, the world's first uh, fully integrated uh, solar satellite uh, television uh, and uh, that we did that not with uh, small TVs because uh, rural uh, people they also have the same size of eyes as, as everybody else so we gave them a decent 24-inch uh, uh, television uh, of which uh, we I'm glad to say we, we've sold uh, uh, thousands of uh, and our customers are very happy uh, with our partner with uh, partnership with uh, with Zuku and uh, uh, all our products uh, are so innovative that uh, they have uh, artificial intelligence built in them. Uh, we manufacture quality products, um, not out of China, but actually out of uh, Malaysia. Um, and our contract manufacturers, they, they make products for people like Bosch, uh, Dyson. Uh, so that's the quality of product with cutting edge technology that you have in the hands of uh, uh, rural Africans. And we're very proud of that. Um, and today, um, it's, a, it's a pleasure for us to unveil um, something else, and I would like to invite uh, Simon, uh, together with uh, our, our honorable guests, to come and uh, help with the unveil. Um, I would also like to invite um, uh, two of our uh, agents um, who, who are helping to, to install these products uh, uh, in, the, in the field. Um, and I would also like to invite uh, if um, our distribution partners uh, Raju Shanga and Mobicom are represented to, to please come along. So, um, are we ready for the surprise? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen. So, we want to, we want to equip the, the rural Kenyan household um, with, with something bigger, something better something long-lasting. We've done a lot of uh, research um, in, into this. Uh, we've, we've looked at what our, our customers want. Of course, um, everybody wants, everybody's aspiring, they want something bigger and better. So after the 24-inch TV, I'm very pleased to announce um, that uh, today we're launching our 32-inch television, uh, fully integrated with uh, satellite. It comes with the artificial intelligence, but uh, uh, something very unique and another first for Azuri uh, is that this TV is specially customized, specially designed to, to, to work in rural Africa. Uh, it comes with a tough screen, which nobody else has got, uh, which uh, is, is toughened glass. I mean, we, we all know the environments that uh, the beautiful uh, uh, rural Kenya uh, is in. And, and we, have, we have dusty conditions. Uh, uh, we, we, wa we wash a lot of uh, our, uh, not only clothes, but some of the equipment with the sunlight powder. But, but this is long lasting uh, toughened glass. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, brake tests and uh, it, it works very well. And uh, uh, I think Mr. Ashok will be very happy because he will minimize his uh, insurance claims. So, so here we have, can we, can we unveil the, the 32 inch uh, Azuri television? fully integrated with satellite. Very well priced, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for, a, for a whole television lighting system, um, it, it goes only for uh, 8999 so 9,000 deposit, 
uh, and as little as 129 shillings a day, um, customers can, can use uh, this television. And there you go, those are the Azuri lights working. So we, we hope that um, each of you will get your, your grandmothers and your uncles and aunties uh, living in the shags uh, to, to get one of these systems. Thank you everybody for, for coming today. We really appreciate it. Um, if you've got any burning questions or you want to explore any business opportunities, this is that moment. It's called serendipity. Seize it if that's what you want. And uh, you've got everybody here uh, if that's the case. But once again, thank you for today's MindSpeak. Thanks for being part of our audience and being part of the journey. Thank you very much.